Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Cyclical Investors Club YouTube channel. My name is Corey Kramer, and today we're going to be analyzing Humana stock after their recent release of really miserable and surprise, um, su surprisingly bad forward guidance for 2024. This one did come in by request down in the comment section of one of my other videos um, a while back, and I had it on my list on the whiteboard behind me, but I've bumped it up the list because of the breaking news and the plunging stock price, and I'm sure many investors are wondering um, whether it's a good buy now. Um, if you have a request you would like me to take a look at, just drop it in the comment section. I'll get it on the whiteboard, and eventually I'll make a video. If it's a stock that's in the S&P 500 like Humana is, I will post the video on YouTube for free. And if it's not, I will still make a video, but I will post it in Patreon and in the full Cyclical Investors Club service over on Seeking Alpha. Um, Patreon is $5 a month. And if you join there, you get a big discount if you ever decide to join the full Cyclical Investors Club service. Um, as always, this isn't individual investing advice. This is just how I analyze stocks. Okay, let's get into Humana. So first we wanna look at um, the historical earnings, right? The historical earnings patterns like we always do. Uh, so let's get rid of the misery that's coming here and look back. I have to shorten this up so I can get individual years displayed at the bottom. There we go. So during the Great Recession, we had 8% decline in earnings. 2012, we had 10 2014, we had a 14. So this isn't really a very cyclical business, generally speaking. Um, another thing worth noting is because of the threat of Obamacare and potentially government kind of fully socializing the healthcare system in 2009, uh, the market was very, along with a plunging stock market, the market was very, very negative on these stocks um, and trading all the way down to low single digit PEs back here in 2018. It wasn't limited to Humana, it was a lot of other healthcare stocks. Um, and so it's, you, have, you wanna be a little bit careful, and I'll talk about this later, when we try to compare what's happening now in terms of valuation to what was happening back then. So. Once um, it was clear that, you know, insurance companies were actually going to be huge beneficiaries of Obamacare, um, then it started trading at um, like a 20 PE on average compared to, you know, like a third of that, which is what was happening back here. So to me, I think uh, this is more similar to what we might see in the future, but we do have interest rates that have risen and things like that, and we do have inflation and so forth. Um, so maybe instead of this 20 PE, the standard 15 PE, which is this orange line, might be what you would, just the rough estimate you might use to the future. So it's kind of weird because it went from a very depressed sentiment to pretty optimistic sentiment, along with interest rates being zero and you know, there are other factors, but you can see the big change from being below this orange line to above it and almost never like right on it, um, which is unusual, which would be unusual. Now, a lot of stocks because of interest rates have tr and just general money and economy, general money in the stock market have traded above like the very long term average um, 15 PE. But you can definitely see the, the big difference here. So we just want to note that um, going forward. OK, so. The other day, this was expected to be like $28, and now it's 16 So that's the big news here for next year's earnings. So this changed overnight, basically. People were expecting, and this went down as well, I think, um, expecting this to rise, and then it just got totally creamed, basically. And I think it's just because costs were higher than were expected, and so premiums were not as high as they should have been. Um, my expectation is probably it will take a couple years for that situation to sort of remedy itself. But if you can, this, I wouldn't consider this a normal, like a turnaround. This is like the, it's not really a turnaround. It's, um, you know, like a, 
a bump in the, I'd hate to say bump in the road because it's bigger than that, but it's like a spike down. It's an unexpected event. Um, it's kind of I like a, it's one time that we know is going to work itself out, but we don't know how, how soon it will work itself out, right? Um, because there's going to be politics involved like there always is, and it, it may depend on regulations and things like that. There's going to be pushback to raising people's rates. Um, to make up for the fact that medical care is costing more. So that's the quick setup of everything. I don't think this is, now this could turn into like a longer trend. It always can, but there's no evidence of that yet. Um, I think whatever price you end up buying this, you wanna give it probably three years. And if it's still struggling, then you need to question and say, okay, maybe this long, upward trend that we've had in earnings since for the past two decades, probably longer, is probably maybe near an end. But they've gone through periods where there wasn't much earnings growth right here. One, two, three, four, five, six. I mean, there's like six years basically where it really there was no growth in earnings. Um, so these period, like a period of stagnation could happen. It, it could bounce back like this and just stagnate. We don't really know what's gonna happen. But I think whatever kind of investment you end up making in this stock, if you do, you want to give it three years to play out and just ignore every. Once you make the once you make the investment, turn off the news and just see and come and visit it three years later and see where you're at. Um, so I think that's the best way to approach it. So, but now let's try to to see if we can get a valuation on it. Um, the basic one is we're down here at Fort. We're at 14, but not using the forward earnings. That, it's like a blended earnings where they go, I think a couple quarters forward and a couple back, which might not be enough to capture this. So I calculate my own and we'll, we'll take a look at that. So <clears throat> this is gonna get a little complicated, but not super complicated. Um, and fortunately, everything's gonna kind of point in the same direction here. So this was the earnings growth rate um, leading up to this, um, to this kind of disaster earnings next year. Really, really fast. Probably unsustainably fast. And after we, in the future, when I include this dip, even if they recover, that'll probably bring this down closer to like 10% or something like that. Um, so, but for right now, this is what history has shown that they've been able to do over since 2015, I think is where this started. Um, so that, Let's just start by using the basic kind of earnings growth rate. But here's the thing, that earnings growth rate is gonna start off of earnings that are only $16 a share. So I'm using the, the worst, I think um, analysts are now at 16.38. The company said 16, I'm using the more pessimistic 16. So um, I, that's a huge drop. So you're being really pessimistic on the initial earnings and then you're going to say, okay, from that pessimistic earnings, can they they can grow 15% off that bottom? That's what this is assuming, right? So, and if you look, this is so. If you look at what analysts think, they think that they're going to go 54% in the first year and then 19 the second year, right? Well, if you averaged that out and then you threw in some single digit years, you maybe in the end you get to 15, right? So, it's it's all how you want to do it. But I look forward 10 years and no more. So. Um, the setup is we're being very pessimistic on the earnings uh, and that's why it makes sense to maybe keep this higher earnings growth rate going forward from there. Okay, with that set up, there, I do have a little bit of an adjustment for debt here. Um, I'll tell you how much, 17%. So I'm treating this as though the stock price is actually 423 instead of 362. So if you're gonna buy the whole business and the debt and whatever other obligations they have, um, you'd have to pay a little bit more. So that's included in this earnings yield. Um, the earnings yield is the PE ratio inverted. So in PE ratio is price over earnings. Earnings yield is earnings over price. They are exactly the same thing. So um, they're just expressed in a different way. This one's gonna be a percentage. So 3.78% is what that is. So the, way, the reason I do that and the way I think about it is if I bought Humana's business for a hundred bucks, and I own the business, it would earn $3.78 per share um, on that $100, right? 
So I could take that 378 if I own the business and go spend it on whatever else I wanted to spend it on. Um, and it would grow at 15% per year. Um, so including my original $100 investment, the hundred the hundred and four dollars does not grow at fifteen percent. Only the three dollars or the four to forty or the nine forty eight. That's a mistake. Sometimes people ask me about. Um, so how much would you have after ten years? Well, you'd have one ninety one about. Um, if you put that in a Kager calculator, that gives you a Kager of six point six eight percent. So that's cheaper than the market. Um, which is more like 5.5, maybe a little lower than that now. Um, so it would be kind of undervalued using these assumptions, um, but not undervalued enough to buy quite yet. I want this to be, 6.5 is actually what I consider fair value. So I would, I would call this like fairly valued right now, um, even after the drop, given everything else. So... And I've been tracking this one down for a while and I keep kind of lowering my um, expectations, which has been good because it helped avoid buying this one too soon. I do own Cigna and Elevance, which I bought back in 2021. They're both up, they both done well. They have been hurt by the news um, that Humana has out. But not buying too soon is you know, prevented from this second stage down of 20%. So. Sometimes being patient is good um, and we're still being patient, but also what's, what usually happens, but not always, is when this happens, especially if it doesn't recover quickly, investors will start to get a little discouraged and worried. And, and when they look forward, it doesn't look very good. Um, and when that gets darker as time goes on, especially if there's any more negative news, then you can get that real capitulation and then maybe we can get like a deal on this stock. So um, to get to 8%, we need about $281.50 right now. That's where my basic earnings would be a buy. Um, using a recession PE approach based on 2020, not 2008, which would be much lower um, 285.76. So these are almost lining up exactly together. Um, it gives me a little more confidence that they might be right. Now, the recession PE is a little bit different because what can happen is when you get these big, like just earnings just get whacked, people will start using this 16 PE as their point of measurement. If this gets a little worse, then they'll, they'll adjust even more. If this gets overdone, um, let's say it comes in at 15, like they're just estimating, right? It could be worse. So then we can get kind of a real whoosh down. And what would happen then is with my normal buy price, while these are together, actually it is a little bit lower right now. So we're seeing it just a little bit happen. But let's say it got worse. Um, if those earnings expectations went down, maybe this goes to 250. Well, as those earnings expectations come down, uh, this price gets lower and lower and there's really no limit to how negative it can get even if the next year those earnings are going to bounce back. Um, and so I use the recession PE at this stage um, before I used it to keep me from buying too soon, which it was very successful at doing. Um, at this stage though, now that this is lower than the recession PE, because the recession PE, which I'll show you, is pretty static. Um, it doesn't change too much. Usually it just changes because of the debt levels relative to the price of the stock. Um, but And sometimes I stop making that adjustment as time goes on, but just so it doesn't end up doing the same thing that this does and follow it down. If you think and expect that the earnings will rebound within a year or two, it makes sense to use the recession PE. The whole idea behind it is there's a recession, things are bad, but they're temporarily bad and they're gonna recover. Those are the assumptions that are embedded in this. So here's how it works. I take the peak earnings of the last, and I'm using 2020 here, um, instead of 2008. So I take the peak earnings, which was which were right here um, at 1787, and then I take the low price, which was 208. 25 and I create a PE out of that. So it's 
low price to peak earnings. So what we have over here, when this happens again, the peak earnings are going to stay 2609, no matter what happens this year with the with the the decline. So you'll see I have 2609 here. Um, and so let's see here. Yeah, so the peak earnings will stay 2609, but the price will move. So as this price moves relative to that 2609, that gives you the recession PE <clears throat> to compare to this one back here. And so the, what you're basically doing is you're comparing this downturn from peak earnings to this downturn from peak earnings and just help using that as a rough guide on what might make sense to enter to enter the stock. Um, so when I do that, I get a 12, actually I get an 1165 PE. And then I gave myself a little bit of 10% buffer because usually uh, I don't aim for the exact bottom of like whatever the previous decline was. Um, so there's like a little 10% buffer, especially if you think on like a technical basis going back to 2020, there definitely could be some technical um, analysts who are looking at that as a potential double bottom. If you get in a little bit before that, it just gives you a better chance of actually buying the stock and not just barely missing like a double bottom. Um, and sometimes I, ha I have different thresholds. This can be no buffer up to 40% buffer. Um, if I was using those 2008 ones that were really low, like four, I would add 40% to that if I was going to use those to give it more of a buffer just because it's so much deeper. Um, so this, these are all estimates, but when you work them all out, <clears throat> they um, they can serve as a good guide when things are like super chaotic, which they're probably going to be for Humana. Um, okay, so, and then I already had the debt adjusted price. So that's how... Um, that's how we get the recession PE and how I calculate it. And what I want to know is um, at what price is it, will it hit that recession PE again? Um, and this would be the debt adjusted. Um, there's a debt adjustment included in here. So and that, that's 285.76. And this basically won't really change um, unless I change that debt adjustment. So this one could keep going lower if earnings are expected to go lower. This one's locked in here and they're both about 20% lower from where the stock is now. So this $285.76 price is where I will almost certainly be buying. Um, I've been pretty patient with this one also because I do own a couple health insurers already, um, Elevance and Cigna. I don't own Molina, I don't own United Health. I don't own CVS. So there's some I don't, um, but I wasn't in a rush if there was a downturn because they're all probably going to get hit to one degree or another. Um, and you can soften some of that blow and benefit from it if you can add new names. And by adding different, um, you don't want to add poor quality ones, but Humana is not really poor quality. So it's an, if, if you add another quality business instead of doubling down on the ones that you already have, you can spread the risk around a little bit if there's some individual stock risk and there and there always is there can be scandals and accounting issues and there can be all kinds of weird things that come up um, lawsuits and things um, they can affect an individual um, stock so you can have the industry exposure increased while decreasing the individual stock exposure by adding another one so this is where I'm looking to add Humana with a, like a one percent weighted position like normal um, and I would say at this point, it's pretty locked in unless something really unusual happens. Okay, I hope that was useful. There was a lot of kind of concepts here, but um, I think that this is a nice, clean, relatively clean example of um, having a basic analysis and just layering in a couple more factors to keep you from, I mean, it's the difference between being an average investor and above average investor. It's those tiny little things that keep you from buying, you know, 20% higher um, than here. And when it didn't look too bad, like it looked like, okay, right? So, and nobody really knew that earnings were going to fall in by a third or something, uh, maybe more than th closer to a half, really. Um, nobody really knew that and you just kind of had to have the patience 
if you have that margin of safety that you're waiting on, sometimes the bad news can come out before it gets to your margin of safety. And that's kind of what happened here. Um, and sometimes you can avoid those. They're always going to be on the edge and sometimes you'll get them and then the bad news will come out. But we've seen this happen with a lot of stocks um, recently. Um, and if you go back and watch my videos I, that I made beforehand, 3M is a good one to go watch. Um, Advanced Auto Parts is a good one to watch. Um, what was the other one that we had? Oh, Archer Daniels Midland. So I have a video on that. That's a little, you know, where it's just like when your prices that you're willing to buy are a little bit lower, if you're being cautious about potential downturn or boom bust in the case of Archer Daniels, um, then when those kind of, usually the bad news comes out when things are already starting to kind of go down or are down. And so when those bad news things come out, you haven't stepped in too early and bought ahead of them. Um, and you get a clearer idea of what earnings are really doing sometimes um, when you have a little bit more patience. And sure, sometimes you miss out, but cash is yielding 5% still. So <laughs> there's no hurry, I don't think. Um, when the forward returns are like five and a half, and at least over the short term, cash is yielding close to that. Um, I just don't see any rush to rush anything into anything unless it's pretty cheap. Um, all right, you got everybody have a great weekend. And if you found this uh, video useful, hit the subscribe button. Uh, we're growing pretty fast here. Um, and uh, you ha have a request, uh, drop it in the comment section. I'll get it on the board and I'll make a video. Thanks a lot. See everybody later.